In the dark future, corporations run the land in every way they can, to the point where if you have been shot in some crossfire from a peacekeeper, you best hope you have paid your trauma team subscription or you'll just be left out on the street to die. These corporations have grown more and more over the decades since the 1990s and have now started taking over the rule of certain countries. Within Italy, for example, most farmland has been completely wiped out and replaced with corporate buildings who mass produce food for the public. By the 2000s, these corporations started taking international matters into their own hands, forming their own private militaries to try and take out the competition by force, leading to a new form of warfare called the corporate wars. For America, their great powerhouse corporation would be known as Militech, and within the late 21st century would go on to fight all of their national and international problems after being fully nationalized after what was the fourth corporate war. But now in charge of the American military, Militech have become an extremely dodgy force feared by many of the NUSA people and have been cast out of many of the independent states such as Texas and even Night City having an extremely hostile outlook on them despite having one of their headquarters in the main center. So who are Militech? How did they form? Why are they considered one of the biggest corporations in the world and what happened in their timeline? Well in today's episode we will be exploring the full nationalized armament corporation known as Militech and how they influence the world of of cyberpunk. This is the story behind Cyberpunk's Armament Corporation. This is the story behind Militech. The year was 1996 and an Italian weapons designer known as Antonio Lucchesi would go on to finally set up his own company in which he'd bring his designs to the world stage. Setting up this company he would name it Armatech Lucchesi International and took a few years to get it all going. After two years of setting up everything he needed, Armatech Lucchesi International took part in some new trials of a brand new standardized US infantry assault weapon that was to revolutionize militaries of the world. As these trials continued, the US government decided that this was a thing they definitely wanted to invest in to help bolster their forces, despite still being in massive debt from the economic collapse of 1994. Eventually, three finalists from different corporations were selected, the first being the FNSAP, a cheap but clunky and unreliable weapon that seemed to be only considered due to the powerful ties between the company Fabrique International and the US government, as well as having ammunition and parts that were compatible compatible with other members of NATO, or what was left of NATO anyway. The second gun was the Colt AR-17X, which was an incredibly good weapon in all of the testing, but was held back massively due to how expensive it was. And the third option was by Armatech Lucchesi International, which was a rifle that was considered compact, reliable, and moderately priced. As these finalists were considered, the USMC General Donald Lundy, who was overseeing the trials, quickly became wowed by the Armatech tech system stating it was the best combination of price, reliability, sturdiness and accuracy. All seemed to be going the way of Armatech as their creation was clearly better than the rest of the competition by a long shot. However, despite all of Donald Lundy's plans to get this contract with Armatech, the US government ultimately had the final say. And due to the recovery of the US economy thanks to the crash of 1994, the contract was once again given to FN to make their extremely unreliable but extremely cheap guns for for the national military. This news did not stop Lucchesi's company, however, as they continued to create and sell their own weapons, but this time to more private buyers. In 2003, however, the US were sent into South and Central America once again to start their war on the supposed drug dealers who were responsible for the downfall of American society. This wasn't the true reason as to why they went in there, but regardless, the troops were there in their masses. This war was the first sign that the US's choice in cheap and unreliable weapons was a bad decision as thousands of soldiers were dying in the field as their weapons would clog up and become unusable thanks to the tropical conditions they were fighting in. Lundy saw how devastating this war was becoming thanks to their terrible choices made by the government. But at this point in time he had already resigned from the Marine Corps in 1998 shortly after the gun trials and in an act of protest became the active CEO of Armatech at the request 
of Lucchese, as he could see how passionate Lundi was for his brand. Lundi wasn't just a previous member of the Marine Corps, he was also a former Pentagon chief, meaning he had an absolute ton of experience and knowledge within the modern military industry, which meant he could see which of the companies out there were becoming incredibly bureaucratically top heavy, selling extremely cheap and shoddy weapons, as well as all of the other majorly overpriced products that they could sell thanks to their many political contracts going out there. With this huge insight, Lundi was able to see a massive opportunity for more streamlined and efficient manufacturing of military products that would be able to make extremely high quality modern equipment at really affordable prices, something Lucchese showed was possible back in 1998. The only thing Lundi wanted to focus on was reaching the private market instead of just trying to tie down political contracts, allowing them to get on the global market and be essentially a household name. As Lundi came up with this pitch to revolutionize the company he had now become CEO of, he would match it with Lucchese's brilliance in weapon design and together would allow Armatech to start boosting their capital, propelling the company into a period of huge growth and expansion. It didn't take long before the world started noticing this huge brand growing more and more all over the world with their very clear business strategy. And because of how big they had become, it was finally time for a full rebrand. The company needed to change its name to help it stand out more and become far more recognizable. With that, Militech Arms International was officially born and their global success was at brand new heights. This success was evident within 2004 when the company saw a major opportunity all thanks to the Second Central American War. During this point in time, the US government was massively humiliated by the mass loads of losses happening out within the countries they were fighting with. So much so that their contract with FN was officially scrapped and the FN SAP rifle was no more. It had cost way too many lives and despite it being cheap, it was still too pricey to keep going. Needing a brand new supplier for their military, the US government came crawling back to Militech and chose their new standardized military weapon, which was the Militech Ronin Light Assault Rifle. And with that, the contract was officially signed between the two, as well as another contract for a military sidearm they had created, which helped Militech see a huge growth in that specific weapon all over the globe, to both nations and corporations alike. Essentially, these guns were the gold standard all over the world. This continued on for many years and by 2010, Militech became the largest defense contractor in several countries, which included the US. But not only that, they were the go-to for military arms by a lot of corporations who would use the weaponry to take over lesser companies and ones who were on the brink of failing, which would trigger the many corporate wars happening throughout the globe. Despite all of that, however, not all was bliss within the headquarters of Militech, as there were frequent power struggles among amongst those at the top of the corporation. Donald Londy was always seen to all of the workers within the corporation as being a solid leader that could never do any wrong. He was the one to lead them into great success as he had since proven. However, the board of directors had other ideas, never seeing him in a positive light. Maybe they could see who Lundy really was, because putting it bluntly, Donald Lundy was extremely power hungry and was not afraid to show it. His sole goal for this corporation was to make Militech the largest largest military force on earth, something that the board members weren't too keen on. To do this, however, Lundi needed to win the corporate battle against their closest competitors, the Japanese military supplier known as Arasaka, who dominated the Eastern Hemisphere. With Lundi despising the Japanese corporation, tension between the two started getting more and more hostile, so much so that many people all over the world were worried that soon there was going to be a corporate war involving those two, and when it began, it would be the big biggest they had ever seen. Because of this fear, many within Militech started disagreeing with other members, leading to a lot of turmoil in the corporation's decision making going into the next decade. As time went on, many members of Militech left to find other careers not agreeing with the direction the corporation was going in, and also to help the corporation grow even further by inserting themselves into other fields. Within 2020, for example, an ex-president of Militech known as Elizabeth Kress would go on to become the new 
President of the United States, helping the corporation grow even further, especially in the US, making them essentially the country's own private army that supplied them with the latest and greatest technology in case anyone were to invade them. With that said, Donald Lundy at this point in time was becoming a paranoid mess of a man, thinking that everyone was against him and that he was losing control of his own company. That was not exactly true, as many people were still extremely loyal to him. But with the board against him and Arasaka on the rise in the rest of the world, it was only a matter of time before he officially snapped. But the year was now 2023 and both Militech and Arasaka had reached their peak. And finally, it was time to engage with the competition and try to shut them down once and for all to become what Donald Lundy always wanted, to be the largest force on planet Earth. In the year of 2021, the two rival Aqua Corps of Sino and Oteg would start warring against each other in an attempt to grab the resources of another failing Aqua Corp known as IHAG. Grabbing those resources would mean the corporation that got them would become the largest underwater shipping and technology supplier in the world and could essentially run a monopoly on that market. To do this though, both corporations needed a good military to scare the other one into either surrendering or just wiping them out out for good. Here Militech's defense forces were contracted as a supplementary support for Otech's security forces and to help them with military tactics through the use of advisors, supplying them with weaponry as well as other crucial supplies. On the other side, Sino would hire the help of Arasaka to fight their battles and supply them with their own resources, pitting the two megacorps against each other. At the beginning, however, no conflict happened between Arasaka and Militech as neither wanted to engage in direct direct conflict. Instead, both wanted to advertise and demonstrate how powerful each one were. For Donald Lundy, however, he was desperate to take out Saburu Arasaka as he saw defeating this big corporation as a way of defeating the whole of Japan, something that he was passionate for due to links to their involvement in World War II at a guess. As the war between Otek and Sino took off, Militech and Arasaka started getting involved with covert operations and got ready for if anything got even more heated. Lundy during this time believed that Militech were officially at war and as he was always of a soldier mindset knew that the only way out of this war was by wiping out Arasaka once and for all with Militech being utterly victorious. However as 2022 came around the ocean war between both Sino and Otech had come to an end with a peace accord being signed on the 27th of February. Despite that Arasaka continued on their mission on their own accord this time developing a software named Soul Killer 2.5 which would capture the engram of anyone they wished and stored it in their database to extract as much data as possible from them. Here they were going to use it on a Militech executive and interrogate them, officially triggering a grand conflict between the two superpowers, who were simply just trying to destroy each other now. With the two now warring against each other, a ton of governments all over the world tried to stop them from causing outright destruction on the many cities they inhabited. With some states in the US such as Texas and Southern California deciding to take over the corporation's facilities and nationalize them to try and teach them a lesson and stop the ever-growing conflict. Eventually the EEC threatened to get involved as well, but despite all of the worry about their ever-growing conflict, Arasaka forces went on to invade a military Militech showroom within Italy, causing yet again more destruction. But this was the last straw, and finally the EEC got involved, seizing all of the assets owned by both corporations throughout the whole of the European continent. Japan also followed this despite everything Arasaka had done for them over the years, and nationalized all of Arasaka's assets within its borders and its surrounding territories. It seemed like all was lost for Militech and Arasaka as the world was fighting back, taking everything from them. However, the war would go on to reach its peak on the 20th of August 2023, where Militech would set up secret strike teams that were going to enter Arasaka Tower from its rooftop to gather all of the vital Arasaka data from the pre-data crash, as well as the Soul Killer program. And if all were to fail or not go as planned, they would go on to deploy small nuclear weapons within Saburu's office, taking out their HQ in Night City completely. This team would consist of the legendary solo Morgan Blackhand, iconic rocker boy Johnny Silverhand, as well as his team of Rogue, Spider Murphy, 
and Shaitan. As this mission went ahead, lots of different stories were told about what happened within the building, but the end result was always the same. This team would set off the small nukes and completely destroy the tower and the surrounding area around it. This blast would kill over 12,000 people within the corporate center of Night City, causing a further 750,000 plus deaths in the following days due to how much radiation and debris had been flung into the atmosphere. With this attack now over, the world needed to take drastic action to make sure no attacks like this ever happened again, and these two mega corporations needed to be fully stopped now. Soon after the fourth corporate war came to an end with Son of Saburu Kai surrendering their involvement, President Elizabeth Kress would go on to declare martial law throughout many different parts of the country to make sure they were under full governmental control to make sure nothing else was going to break out and cause even more chaos. On top of that, she would also go on to blame the whole attack on Arab Arasaka, stating they deliberately destroyed Night City to assert dominance and destroy America from the inside. However, despite all of these public claims, many people demanded that Militech come forward and take responsibility for their actions, knowing full well that they were the one who launched the attack, not Arasaka. Despite some of that public outcry calling for justice, President Kress would go on to take full ownership of Militech, nationalizing all of the corporation to make sure her federal rule was at full strength, and no one could challenge her rule. For those within the top seats of Militech themselves, they were offered lucrative positions in the reformed NUS Department of Defense. Most would accept these offers. However, for their main CEO, Donald Lundy, he had become completely paranoid by this point and extremely hot-headed and objected massively to this change of his corporation. With Militech now officially a nationalized corporate asset, they would continue on as a private corporation to some extent on the side, secretly rebuilding back to its former role as a combination of arms manufacturer and mercenary army. This was a difficult task for them as they had lost so much during their war against Arasaka, but that didn't stop them as they would continue to use their many different contacts and many experts in guncraft to remain as one of the world's largest producer and seller of an all manner of military weapons all over the world, with not many countries really caring about what had happened to them during the fourth corporate war. For Donald Lundy, despite his massive outbursts before and after the nationalization, he would remain as the CEO and main leader of the corporation, still being incredibly influential throughout the whole of the board of directors. That said, he technically wasn't in complete power of Militech as he did not own enough stock to control the corporation. The only reason he was able to persuade so many people was because of his fierce personality, strong allies and connections, and his incredible success record that had kept Militech on top for many, many years. With that said, his hatred for Arasaka had made him many enemies, not just within Japan, but throughout the rest of the world, with one being President Kress herself, who would do everything within her power to make sure he did nothing stupid and start more hostilities with Arasaka or anyone he actively disliked. In 2045, sadly for many within Militech, Donald Lundy would pass away, but not before he named his new son, Donald Dixie Lundy Jr., a member of the corporation's board. Many mourned the loss of this great man, paying tribute to everything he had done for this company and how he had helped them grow over the years. Despite his final years being filled with hatred and anger for how they had been pulled out of their war against Arasaka and turned into a national company, his legacy and direction would forever be remembered throughout all of the Militech Corporation and his plans for the company would continue on in the many years going forward, with many of the leaders of the corporation still idolizing everything about him. By 2077, Militech still maintained its title of one of the largest manufacturers of weapons and military vehicles in the world. However, thanks to the Fourth Corporate War, found itself with more competition of not just Arasaka, who was still a massive supplier within the Eastern Hemisphere, but now the corporation of Kang Tao, who were gaining tons of new traction thanks to their creation of their own unique smart pistol that was first sold in China, but was now selling all over the world, with them holding one of their main headquarters 
headquarters within Night City, overlooking the other headquarters of Militech, and also the newly built Arasaka Tower that stands where the old one once stood. For Militech though, they would start working closely with the American military and police agencies throughout the decades, providing all of them with high-grade weaponry and machinery, as well as the best training they could ask for. This was all thanks to them being fully nationalized, so every aspect of them as a corporation had to be for the American people, and they had to give back everywhere they could, and in this case, it was with their full arsenal. They had gained some independence within this time, however, as many of their board of directors members now held high-ranking offices within the Ministry of Defense, enabling them to pull all of their strings and help Militech grow in power, essentially taking as much from the government as the government was taking from them. This whole agreement with the NUSA government allowed for Militech to grow even further, and 60% of the corporation's contracts came directly from the president. On the side, however, Militech went into entertainment as well, as they were going to produce and release a movie named Corporate Wars the Musical, which saw many mixed reviews on its release, with lots praising the film for its story and musical numbers, and others criticizing the movie for its melodramatic plot and propaganda. Essentially, the film was set within the Fourth Corporate War, as it would go on to completely idolize General Donald Lundy, whilst demonizing Arasaka at every chance it possibly could. The plot revolved around the General's daughter, Sarah, who would go on to fall in love with a young idealist named Andrew, who would worship everything Saburu Arasaka did. During the plot, Kai, Saburu's son, would see Andrew's loyalty to him and would use him as a pawn in their operations, installing a nuclear device into Andrew's heart, which would detonate when he came to the conclusion that Arasaka had lost the war. At that same time, he would also launch a false flag operation to destroy the Arasaka Tower to push all of the blame on Militech. However, the plan failed as the detonator never went off, leading to Kai killing Sarah himself, breaking Andrew's heart, and then finally leading to the detonation going off. By the ending of the film, Andrew, moments before his death, would go on to realize that he had been played by Arasaka and he was just a pawn in everything they did. And because of this blind, stupid decision of joining Arasaka, he had lost everything. Essentially, the film was a big statement that said if you did join Arasaka, you will be part of the enemy as they are extremely evil. And if you do join them like Andrew did, you will lose everything. So it's not surprising many saw this as blatant propaganda. Over in Night City within 2077, Militech was considered the second biggest and best corporation to work for, where all of the employees would be given up to 50% discount of all Militech weapons and supplies, and most likely free tickets to watch the Corporate Wars the musical as many times as they liked as well. Some other Militech soldiers would also be based out within the area of Pacifica known as Dogtown. These soldiers would be the remaining troopers from the Unification War, who were almost sent in to attack the whole of the city to force them into the new United States that President Myers was trying to achieve. Eventually, Arasaka would enter Night City to defend them from these NUSA forces, and as soon as they did, Myers would retreat all of them from the area. Some, like these Militech troopers in Dogtown, would remain, keeping an eye on all things going on within the area, and maybe doing some dirty work for Myers that was kept completely confidential. However, that is a story to be explored at a later date. As the year progressed on, President Myers would announce that she was running for yet another term as president of the NUSA, despite all of her warring years trying to force states into being part of her rule, devastating many with bombing runs and troop attacks. Many people definitely didn't take kindly to her decision of running again, as they knew she could bring about more chaos to the whole of America. That said, she had been a CEO of the Militech Corporation for many years before becoming president, and with many members of the board being higher-ups in the Pentagon, it was seen within Militech's interest to keep her in power, as with her in power, they would grow even further and gain even more assets. The people of the NUSA, despite having some of the best protection in the world, were not too crazy on having Militech's involvement in the running of the country, with Washington DC serving as Militech's largest consumer. But with that said, if the capital ever ran out of money, Militech as a corporation would lose everything as well, meaning the people would be free from their control but at the same time, their country would not have any money, so not really an ideal situation. The most recent thing Militech has done within 2077 is come up with a new plan to expand their corporation up into the stars and construct a new colony on Mars.
cars. Here they would start selling residential modules all over. And if they were to dominate this red planet, who knows what would happen going into the later years of the 21st century. To this day, Militech are still seen as an incredibly powerful force, albeit extremely controversial, with many of their scandals being exposed to the masses. Since their attack on the Arasaka Tower in 2023, Militech have been noted as an ethically shady corporation who do blatantly illegal black op missions to take out their opposition or anyone that goes against their clients. These include hiring out their private military to support revolutions, military coups, assassinations, terrorist attacks, and ethnic cleansings. In 2077, Militech was caught massacring innocent citizens of the NUSA, with 75% of the victims being identified as Japanese. President Myers also likes to use Militech as a way of making sure foreign intelligence is shut down very quickly, be that through suspicious trade links, untrustworthy foreign delegates, or just anyone who seems to be anti-government. In the end, Militech is whoever you want them to be. They have the best military out there, the best equipment, and will do any job you require if you have the right amount of eddies, regardless of if it is illegal or extremely unethical. What was once just a simple gun manufacturer has now turned into one of the biggest corporations the world has ever seen, with so much power that they are essentially their own country, pulling the strings from within the NUSA to solve any issues they see fit. Under the leadership of Donald Lundy, they have grown more and more selling some of the best weapons you could ever see, and no matter where you are in the world, you can guarantee that someone in your neighborhood will own a Militech firearm. Where Militech will be going into the 22nd century, no one knows yet. They will either grow more and more and dominate not only Earth, but Mars and space as well, or something will happen. That means they will fall dramatically, taking out every vital asset possible, which would most likely include the NUSA as well. But that story will have to be for another day. But for now, this has been the full story behind the extremely powerful armaments corporation known all over the world as Militech Arms International. I want to say a big thank you for watching this video and a huge thank you to my patrons who allow me to make them on a regular basis, including my small fishes, my big fishes, Anthony, Arto Krem, Christopher, Greg, and Last Persona user, my YouTube channel Wise Ones, Video Game Player 75, Ico the Wolf, Sith Lord 906, A Frosty Vodka, Tomb of Ash, and Fiery Italian, my sharks, Jason X117, Alfred Correa, and Wow Such Gaming, and my Megalodons, Chernobyl Stalker, Hazy Thoughts, Rhoda C, and Sinus. But that is for now thanks for watching again and if you want to support this channel all the links are down below where you can get early access and screenshots of my footage collected as well as some merch and if you want more lore videos check out my playlist below and also check out my audio only versions of these episodes on your selected podcast app such as spotify and apple music and if you did enjoy this please do like comment and subscribe on all platforms to help get them out there and finally with all of that said i shall see you all in the next one cheers